The great Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, arranged the fairy folk of Ireland into different classifications, the royal trooping fairies and the solitary fairies. To this day, many people living in the Emerald Isle actively believe in both. Now, it's important to know your fairies, so we're going to run down the eight most famous forms of these spirit beings. The Marrow Anyone who knows anything about the sea knows of the Marrow. These mysterious dwellers of the depths appear as roughly human in shape, but with scaly skin and serpentine tails for swimming. The male marrow has a long, snarling snout like a boar and needle-like claws. He uses these to snatch unwary fishermen out of their boats. However, the female marrow are quite beautiful, looking exactly like human women, except for the tail. It's said the marrows wear a magical hood or cap called a cahur de This magical hat allows them to swim in the depths of the icy waters. Now, if a fisherman is cunning and agile, he might be able to snag the cap away, and without it, the marrow woman cannot return to the sea. The fisherman may then even persuade the marrow lady to marry him. Marrow make devoted wives, but they are always a bit homesick. If the marrow ever regains her cap, the call of the sea will be too much to bear, and she will return. Sometimes she will drag her hapless suitor with her into the depths. So, is it really worth the risk? Well, ask a lonely fisherman. The Grogak. Though few ever see them, it's said the Grogak resemble small elderly men covered in dense reddish hair or fur. You can sometimes tell they are about by their stench. These mostly naked creatures have terrible personal hygiene. The Grogak are impervious to both heat and cold, and enjoy spending their time in caves. If you stumble across one of their homes, you are more likely to smell them than to see them, because the Grogaks have the power of invisibility. They will only reveal themselves to kindly, trusted humans. If a person of goodwill gains a Grogak's trust, they'll find the creature to be an extremely helpful friend. You can even coax them to do chores around the house. All they ask for this domestic work is a regular delivery of a jug of cream. Of course, if you miss a payment, they will abandon you, but in all, the Grogak is a great example of why it's unwise to judge by appearances. The Puka The Puka is one of the most famous Irish fey folk, and yet also tricky to nail down. That's because this wily character is a shapeshifter, able to take on multiple forms of animals or people. The only clue you've met one is their dark coloring and bright yellow eyes. The form a puka enjoys most is that of a sleek, dark horse. In this shape, pukas will often cause harm to farms, breaking fences, trampling crops, and so forth. But their favorite pastime is to torture mean people, especially drunkards. Oftentimes, a foolish drunk on his way home at night will find a handsome horse in the road, a perfect ride to rescue his sore feet. But if the human mounts, the puka will take the fool on a wild ride, making death-defying leaps across large chasms at breakneck speed. The puka's goal is to scare its rider half to death, before tossing them to the side of the road. Now, the puka can speak the human tongue with ease, so another of its amusements is telling the future. Many an Irish hero has spoken to a puka, often to their game. But just as often as not, the puka will pronounce warnings of doom, especially if it doesn't like you. Pukas, like some other fairies, will respect and help those who respect them. They are especially kind to generous farmers. For instance, if you leave a part of your crop in the field for them to feast upon, they will protect your land. This gift is called the Puka's Share. The Banshee The wail of the Banshee is perhaps the most terrifying sound on earth. It will freeze the blood in your veins and turn your spine to water. This horrifying creature usually appears as a woman. Her form can vary, sometimes a ragged old crone in a gray cloak sometimes a young lady wrapped in a winding shroud. She stands alone on the moors, atop a hill, or by a running brook where she may be seen washing the blood from men's clothing. However, you are far more likely to hear the banshee than see her. Her mournful wails are a warning. She will howl, clap, and cry into the night. Those who hear know one thing for sure, that either they or someone in their family is fated to die. Certain families descended from the ancient rulers of Ireland are said to have their very own banshee. 
She may even be an ancestral spirit who watches the children of her family line, heralding their demise and entry into the other world to meet their ancestors. The Dulahan. While the Banshee's wails are a death warning, the Dulahan is the spirit that collects. The Dulahan is a very popular Irish fairy without most people even realizing it. You see, its appearance is that of a headless man riding a great black horse. The Dulahan carries its head in its hand, which glows with the color of moldy cheese, grinning from ear to ear. The light from the head allows the Dulahan to see great distances. Each night, it recites the name of the victim it plans to catch and rides off by the light of its head lantern. Some tales describe the Dulahan as a coachman. His vehicle is known as the Koist Bodar, meaning deaf or silent coach. Black in color, it is made from human bones and drawn by six black horses, a regal conveyance for the dead. Beware if you are out and about at night, for if you happen to see the Dulahan on his rounds, he may attack you with his whip made from human spines. If hit, you'll be blinded in one eye. If you're lucky, he may only dump a bucket of blood on you. <laughs> no gate or door can stop the Dulahan from arriving at its destination. But some storytellers claim that it has an irrational fear of gold, so perhaps you can bribe him. But really, can anyone cheat death? The Leprechaun. Most people have heard of leprechauns, but these fairies were once a bit different from their modern holiday interpretation. For instance, their name may come from the Middle Irish word Lucrpain Lu, which means small body. Or it may be related to Lith Brogan, which means leather shoes or shoemaker. In folklore, leprechauns are often masterful shoemakers, even providing magical shoes to heroes that do things like allow you to walk underwater, as they did for Fergus MacLechty. While all modern images show leprechauns wearing green, the old Irish poets usually describe leprechauns as wearing red. Leprechauns are often conflated with the Clurican, who are their drunk and mischievous cousins who live in cellars and drink all your wine. Now, about that gold, leprechauns don't technically own pots of gold. Rather, the leprechaun is a guardian of ancient human treasure. It may be money, jewels, or other valuables. These items were often buried for safekeeping, and often an iron, copper, or clay pot was the best container, hence the leprechaun having a pot of gold. If a human captures the leprechaun, they can force the fairy into revealing the location of the treasure hoard. But these wee folk are known for their cunning as well as their mischief. If a human ever looks away from a captured leprechaun, even for an instant, he'll just disappear. So kindness actually works better. One legend mentions a down-on-his-luck nobleman who offered a leprechaun a ride on his horse. In return, the man returned to his crumbling castle to find that it was filled to the ceiling with gold. The Changelings Fairies, like humans, can bear children. However, not all their children are born as beautiful or desirable as they would like. But they have an easy fix for that. A fairy can simply switch its baby with a human one. Unsuspecting human parents may find that their baby has been taken after childbirth and replaced with a fairy child, or sometimes even a senile old fairy. These so-called changelings are hard to identify at first, but their presence will become known over time. Changelings bring only bad fortune to households, and are often very temperamental. Their rancorous cries will never cease, and their appetite is never satiated. These changelings sometimes grow to be deformed and grotesque. Unbaptized babies are most at risk, and the only way to possibly drive out a changeling is to torture it or somehow trick it into revealing itself. For instance, you might try throwing away the inside of an egg and cooking the shell instead. Such backwards behavior confuses a changeling greatly, and it may try to mock or correct you, thus revealing itself. The High Fairies. Finally, we come to the greatest of all the fey folk, the Sluashi, or fairy host, so-called because occasionally their processions will cross the mortal land, a glorious and enchanting sight to see. Christians might tell you that the Shi are descended from fallen angels. Others say they are the last of the mystical tribe of the Danu, the ancient magical founders of Ireland. In either case, these are the mightiest of all the fey kind, rulers of a dark yet colorful realm that mirrors our own. In our world, you may find gateways to their realm in the form of hollow trees, piles of boulders, or small mounds called Deinashi. 
Unlike other magical creatures we've discussed, the Shi are organized, often ruled over by a king or queen. Their business is their own, and woe befall anyone who does not show them proper respect, for instance by disturbing a Dana Shi. These ancient powerful beings live hundreds of years. If you are lucky enough to witness their procession, whatever you do, keep silent and keep still. They punish gonkers with all manner of curses, or simply spirit them away. Time moves very differently in their world, and those who cross over sometimes do not return for decades, even if to them only a single night has passed. While fickle, these beings can bring good fortune to humans they favor. Some even fall in love with mere mortals. Many people living in Ireland absolutely believe in their existence, and even non-believers can't deny that the High Fairies have left an indelible mark on Western culture, from Shakespeare to J.R.R. Tolkien. No doubt this amuses the Shi greatly. So now you know a wee bit about the Fey Folk. Not all of them, mind you. After all, magical beings shift and change all the time. But at least you can walk home safely at night, if you keep your wits about you. May the road rise to meet you. So, do you have any family stories about the Fey Folk? Is your family Irish and maybe something was handed down to you from your grandparents or great-grandparents? Tell us in the comments. If you'd like some more seasonal content about monsters and things that go bump in the night, check these videos out. And as always, we would appreciate greatly if you would subscribe and ring the bell to get notifications. Thanks.